be a very long presentation. We don't have that much time, but I'm awfully glad we had this panel because you asked some great questions. They've already answered a lot of them. A question about travel is using code shares uh, because a lot of there are a lot of uh, alliances now of airlines, and so American airlines are tied into a number of foreign airlines. But as I understand it, still it has to be written on the American ticket, and so it, they often. If, I don't know if you've been to Atlanta, among other things, but you'll go to a gate and you'll see. Delta, of course. Uh, Delta flight 632, Alitalia flight 719, uh, Lufthansa flight 431, da, da 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 Those are all the same flights. They're not different airplanes. But as long as you've got Delta to write the ticket, you can be flying on, on their code shares. Yes, yeah, and there, there's something else that'll, that'll start coming up in the next few years, too. And it's with the EU, and it's called Open Skies. Yes. And it depends on whether you're traveling to an EU state, and if you're traveling on an EU airline, it may become eligible under Fly America also. So it's becoming a lot easier to make to make travel plans. Now. And you will find, just to make this more complicated, in some countries, the in-country Fulbright Commission will buy the tickets for you. And in France, for instance, they'll buy you tickets on Air France because France is paying for half of the grant, and therefore they can buy the tickets on any dang airline they want to. So they don't have to follow uh, Fly America, etc. So it's a country by country thing. Walter and I commented, Earlier today with Fulbright, the two words you need to know, first of all, are it depends. And second of all is be flexible, because in your question about what happens if the grant situation changes, it happens all the time. That's not a big issue, uh, because people work around it. We've had a lot of people who went to Nigeria, for instance, they were going to be teaching in universities, and the universities were on strike about the last 30 years. I don't remember. But anyway, uh, it was very, very difficult to do. So what did they do? They had people who still wanted to learn. They organized classes on their front porches, and they taught there. So Fulbrighters tend to be resilient people. They tend to be ready to roll with the punches, et cetera, because you are applying. If you apply now, you're applying for the, academic, the core program deadline of 1 August 2012 for academic year 13-14. So everything except the specialist program, which has no deadline, you can apply Anytime, day or night, you can be sitting in your pajamas eating a bagel and apply for the specialist program because it has no deadline. You're not actually applying for a specific country. You're not exactly applying for a specific award, but you're applying as an expert in the field who would be interested in going for two to six weeks on some sort of a collaborative process overseas. And so that program can happen anytime. You've usually got four to six weeks leave before you have to be in country for two to six weeks. But it, it just goes on all the time. You can apply anytime you want to. There's no deadline on that program. Whereas all the other programs do have deadlines. And the, the most typical one for the core program is the 1st of August, and that includes a lot of other programs. The International Educational Administrators programs have individual uh, deadlines. German Studies program has its own deadline. If we've got to find out what the topic is, the Germans never tell us until the very last minute. So it's quite interesting. Uh, and so on and so forth. But anyway, this is all on the website, and the website is very important. And so I'm Andy Reese, and I'm from CIS in Washington, which is Council of International Exchange of Scholars, and we are affiliated with the Institute of International Education, which is headquartered in New York, uh, and runs the student program. The Fulbright Teacher Program, which is K through 12, is now being taken over by IIE and will also be administered in Washington, D.C. So three of the four Fulbright programs, the three that are administered through the United States Department of State, are all under the aegis now of the Institute of International Education. The fourth is done through the Department of Education, and that's the Fulbright Hayes program. And that does work with graduate students in the sciences, of, uh, sorry, take that away, the social sciences, the humanities, and the arts. Uh, it also does individual research for scholars, and it also does group projects overseas. But that's run through the Department of Ed, and they have their own sets of Because, of course, unless we're presenting on panels together, we never talk to each other. Uh, that's your tax money at work. Uh, um, and so, I'm here at the University of Florida. I've, I've been on the road now for five straight weeks, just about, so I have no idea where I am from moment to moment. And this is the 24th of April, I hope. Uh, and so I'm Andy Reese. I was for 18 years a program officer. I'm a PhD in Russian history. I've also lived in Russia and dealt with that mess. Uh, and I was brought in as the Soviet expert and then destroyed the Soviet Union and we started all over again. And after a while, they decided I was such a ham that they would put me into outreach because I love talking to people and encouraging them to apply. Because under this aegis, the Fulbright logo, we've had over 310,000 people take the opportunity to go overseas, as you've already heard, to uh, express their dreams and their plans and their hopes for things that they can do overseas and they can accomplish. And uh, they've all done one hell of a great job. And 
so this is the considered the flagship program of the United States Department of State, uh, and they will tell you that. And uh, they will also tell you that in its entire history since 1947, the Fulbright programs together have spent less money than it cost to build a single jet flyer. I, uh, as, a, as a trained academic, I always give a, a, a you know, little outline to get it. This is Senator Fulbright. He was a real person. I always like to say something about him. Very interesting man. We don't have a lot of time, so I won't go into it, but ask me about it. He was quite an intriguing fellow and was, among other things, the youngest president of an American university. When he was president, I believe, at the age of 28 at the University of Arkansas. Then he went and became the longest serving head of the United States Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. So he had quite an interesting career. The program was founded right after the second uh, in the core of the, sorry, the Fulbright Scholar Program that I represent, Walter does the student program. Uh, we send American academics and professionals and administrators overseas to conduct research and to teach, and we bring similar kinds of people to the United States. So always remember that Fulbright's a two-pronged program, and you can be bringing scholars here, as I know you do, to the University of Florida through Fulbright as well. But I like to talk to American scholars because it's up to people overseas to recruit visiting scholars to come here. So I would like to talk to you about the options that are available through Fulbright, sponsored by the United States Department of State, through the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, ECA, which you will hear about if you become involved with Fulbright, probably you'll hear the term batted around because they are our governmental partners. Uh, and we are, uh, we were created uh, originally the Council for National Exchange of Scholars, specifically to administer the scholar program. So we were created in 1947. The idea is that we would work with academics not only to recruit them to apply, but also to make sure that a, an academic peer review process is what distinguishes Fulbright. So it is not a bureaucratic, although there are bureaucrats who get involved all the time, but it is not a bureaucratic program. It is an academic program evaluated by academics. And that's one of the things that, that has always distinguished Fulbright is that it is a peer review process. I put this in because in, in an institution like Florida, it's not a big question, but people come from every kind of institution you can imagine. Uh, throughout the United States, uh, we work very hard with community colleges, for instance, because they enroll half of the undergraduate population in America. So they need to be internationalized as well. But we still believe that class one high research institutions like Florida also need internationalization. Fulbright's a great way to do it. We work with every kind of person from every part of the United States, tenured, untenured, lecturers, etc. I'm so glad you were a lecturer because it's nice to have somebody as a living example of you don't have to be a name chair at Harvard to have a Fulbright, uh, and yet that's a part of the mythology of Fulbright, and it has been always. It is a highly distinguished program, but it becomes distinguished by the achievements of the people who participate in it, not necessarily the titles that they drag around behind them. And so we have artists and writers and all kinds of people. We include absolutely every field, uh, and we work with every kind of institution in America. Uh, and so we would like that message constantly to be going out. The eligibility requirements are simple. You must be a U.S. citizen. You can't be a green card holder for Fulbright. That's just the way the rules are written. And they're written by the J. Reed Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board, which is President of the History Appointed Office that worked on foreign programs. And they're the ones who also created the two limits of uh, 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 lifetime through the core program that was brought up earlier. Um, if you've had a Fulbright student grant, that has nothing to do with scholar grants. If you've had a Fulbright case, it has nothing to do with scholar grants. It's through the scholar grant program, you two in a lifetime under the current arithmetic. And that is either two of the core grants, two distinguished chairs, etc., or one distinguished chair and two of the short-term programs. And so you still have half of the program left to go. You could be okay. a specialist again or a German studies or whatever. Uh, and so that's the current rule. And as was indicated, there are time periods that must be observed between the conclusion of one grant and the beginning of another. So since there's a five-year uh, waiting grant between the two between two core grants, you can actually apply four years in because the beginning of the next grant wouldn't be, wouldn't be until the following year. So that would make up the five year difference. But anyway, these are all rules that you should be aware of. Don't worry about them too much for most of you because I suspect that most of the people in this room are just thinking about starting a Fulbright process. As a consequence, you have a tabula rasa. You're completely clean and you can uh, just begin from the very beginning. Uh, the other thing is degree status, and this is very complicated. Typically, a PhD is the most common degree that people have when they're applying for Fulbright, but there are lots of fields that don't offer PhDs. There are lots of fields in which PhDs are not appropriate, et cetera, et cetera. In the performing arts,
parts, that's obviously typically not the case, so on and so forth. So oftentimes the difference between the degree and uh, the other issue is what are your accomplishments? Do you have a portfolio of professional achievements that says, yes, this person is really a whatever? And my favorite example will always be my ballet dancer who was teaching ballet at a major university. She had a high school education, but she had a portfolio like this that proved, yes, the girl could dance. So we sent her to Russia. She went to the old Imperial uh, Ballet Academy in St. Petersburg, taught modern dance, studied on classical ballet on the side, came back, had a highly successful time. She's now the chair of dance at a major American university, and she still has a high school degree, a portfolio like this, and oh, yes, and of course, Fulbright, which is what really did it. Uh, but anyway, uh, so if, if you've ever got a question, we list the people who work with every country program. Their names are there in the award catalog. Their names are there under contact to us on our website. If you have a question, should I apply? Can I apply? What about this country? Some countries are uh, degree crazy. They feel like if you don't have a PhD, we're somehow talking down to them, no matter what your professional level of experience is. Many aren't. It's like, what can you do? What are you proposing to do, etc. Contact the program staff. It is entirely ethical. Otherwise, we wouldn't have their names, telephone numbers, how about clinical degrees like MD? I'm sorry? Clinical degrees like an MD? Those are cool. It's equivalent to a PhD. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's not a problem. And I'm very proud of my accomplishments in Europe getting medicine, medical research, going in cancer. Uh, because nobody had ever done it. Somebody asked me a question. I said, well, let's find out. We got it going, etc. So, yes, that's absolutely fine. It's whatever works in your field uh, and uh, how you establish your credentials. And obviously, if you've ever got a question, uh, if you just started uh, in that field, perhaps, and you don't have a portfolio, it might be more difficult. I don't know. But ask the program staff because those two words, it depends, apply across the board. Uh, time and time again, situations, my old civics teacher in high school in Waco, Texas, used to say, circumstances alter cases. And she meant it. You never know what's coming up until you ask the question and find out, that, will this work? The worst answer we'll ever give you is no. And that doesn't put you on a blacklist of some sort. It just means, no, this isn't going to work out in this particular country. Have you thought about this country? So things will work virtually everywhere. They just won't work in every single place. And so be willing to explore if you're interested in Fulbright. Language requirement, very quickly, an awful lot of our teaching grants are in English. People want to hear you lecture in English because they're going to use it. They want to develop their own careers by becoming more fluent. So there are lots of places where you can let the lecture in English. You may even find that a number of people in the room are not all over, overly interested in what you're talking about. They just want to hear you do it. Uh, the big exceptions are Latin America, where Spanish and Portuguese are still pretty much the rule. There are some occasional exceptions to that. And Francophone Africa, where you need French. Except if you're teaching American or English literature, then you can do that in English. But then you still have what I refer to as the bread and bathroom issues. And that's once you walk out the door, you're probably going to want to be able to say something in French in order to get around. You may not be able to discuss Racine, but you still want to be able to find out how to get home and where's the bus and this kind of thing. And so lots of Fulbrighters find they become language students when they go overseas to their benefit. Uh, the other thing is research. You must be able to demonstrate that you can conduct successfully the research that you are proposing. Maybe that's in English. It could be you know, an exiled American writer who ran off to France and left a whole bunch of journals that are some in a, in a library, a bibliothèque, or, no, that's a bookstore, isn't it? Anyway, they're in a, a library, or they're in an archive, or whatever, and so they're, you know, you're going to be actually studying in English. That's fine. I'm studying English sources. It may not be the language of the country. Um, I always saw a lot of grants for people who were going to be using Latin for church research. That was what they had to prove they could conduct successfully, not find the, you know, Foley's Berger. Yes. In a country where my interest is Cambodia, and okay. I, I will say that I've already contacted Hillary Watt. Yeah. By the way, is that a he, Hillary? It's a she. She. I wasn't sure. But yeah. I want to. Absolutely awesome. So I've been speaking to Hillary now oh, for two years. She's already set me up. I'm going to be in Cambodia this summer. I've got a visit already scheduled with the U.S. Embassy to talk about the Fulbright. But they speak Khmer. Khmer equals Klingon. Most of us don't, and we don't have a large Cambodian yeah. population no. in this part of Florida. So the school, the students speak Khmer. So how, uh, in terms of Fulbright, and I'm all on an Excel spreadsheet playing with the money, how do you handle the translation services? Does the school pass?
have to provide it, or will Fulbright cover it? How, how well, what I would do is, A, talk to Hillary, look at our, uh, our list of grantees that's online, and talk to people who have been in Cambodia already, and ask them what their experiences were. Uh, typically, my experience has been that the university will help you find translators, or however it's going to work. Uh, it may be that you will sit down and create a lecture with a native speaker, Khmer, who can then get up and you'll say blah, 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 and then he'll say blah, 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 and so on and so forth. It may be simultaneous translation, which is somewhat unusual, but obviously it works because the program has been going down in Cambodia for several years. It's unfortunate it's the two universities that um, most of the students do speak English, and there's never been a nursing faculty. That's exciting. Oh, that's great. But I taught over there before now as a volunteer, and I've had a translator. I just wasn't sure the length of Fulbright, how that works. It's, so. you know, okay, now what are those two magic words? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> it's always going to depend on your particular situation, what the institution can handle, okay. who's available, etc. Right. There's not a hard and fast rule about it. But where there's, and, you know, let's face it, it's pretty unusual to find your average American walking down the street who's fluent in any Southeast Asian language. Uh, and so, you know, whether it even something as common as Thai. So uh, that's something that people are going to be prepared for. The American Embassy is going to be prepared for. The hosting institutions are going to understand that. And so they work with it. And exactly how they work with it may vary by the institution. So, you know. I suppose that my concern is that that can be a cost that I might have to assume. I don't like, think so. Typically, it hasn't been. Yeah, once again, it depends. Uh, if it does come up, make sure that you talk to the embassy about it, talk to Hillary about it, and see if we can't throw some more money at the grant in order to cover translation expenses. I know I used to do that in Russia a long time ago, but once again, it's going to depend on a lot of different <coughs> issues. And, it, and it's always a good idea to bring these types of issues up sooner rather than later. Yeah, yeah as soon as you encounter them, if you suddenly find that you can't accomplish for that reason, they say talk to the American embassy first, talk to the cultural affairs officer, and since obviously Hillary I've run into this problem. Uh, can you help me solve it? And it looks like I can solve it with some more money. Uh, so I can hire someone. But certainly bring it up. Because we never know. We can't anticipate, obviously. Because the program, our grantees reinvent the program under our feet all the time. Because they run into, they go to new institutions, they do new topics, they do all kinds of new things. And this is one of the great things about Fulbright is that it is so incredibly malleable. It just goes all over the place. And so, and it allows people do all kinds of crazy things. And I must admit, you know, if I ever get uh, arrogant about, well, you know, I have a PhD in Russian history, and I graduated from this stage. <laughs> I just look around at what people are doing through Fulbright. I seriously, I look at the list of scholars, and I read the topics that they're working on, and I'm always just flabbergasted by it. I think, my God, we've got an incredible group of people in American academia. They are really inventive and forward-looking, and they're doing all kinds of wonderful things all over the so that's one of the reasons why I've stayed with this job for so long, yeah. is I am inspired by you. It actually is the most enjoyable part of our jobs, is talking with the people that are applying and listening to what they're proposing to do, and just sitting there with your jaw. Uh, you want to do what, where, how? And, and just hearing these projects, this is the most exciting part of this job. It really is. You just don't have any idea. Yeah. So, uh, but there are, you know, as I say, it depends, take that with you, tattoo it on your wrist if necessary, because it's a very valuable expression to keep in mind. Once again, it's Fulbright, and this came up about, I was fascinated, we had three people from the sciences, basically, who were representing Florida. That's wonderful, because one of the myths of Fulbright is you can't, it's only four, and then depending on who you're talking to, it's only for somebody, but not them. It's for everybody. Every field is represented, including new fields that are being invented all of the time traditional fields are running together. And so those are the ones that internally we call heterodox because it's, you know, is biochemistry, biology, or chemistry? No, I don't know. I'm not a biochemist. My personal favorite is legal ethics. I always sort of giggle at that. But anyway, is it law or is it philosophy? I don't know. Uh, and so that's up to legal ethicists to talk about. But we work, you may not be able to do everything in every country, and I can guarantee you that you can't probably, but you can do everything somewhere. And so if the idea is I want this opportunity, there's going to be a place that we can find for you through Fulbright. Uh, the other thing I would mention is, and this is very important because it's mostly happened since I got to Fulbright, and I wish I could take credit for it because I've worked very hard to take credit for everything, but it doesn't happen that way, is that 
this year we have listed 177 all discipline awards. All discipline awards are the other piece of Fulbright. Lots of Fulbright uh, opportunities are what we call programmed awards. They have names to them, uh, sociology, astrophysics, etc. In most countries now, they also have all discipline awards, and those mean uh, usually they're open to all disciplines. So what do you want to do? You tell us. And we've convinced countries that this is a good idea because if they would only do, you know, uh, brain surgery, tap dancing, and plumbing, that's all they're ever going to get. What about all those other people in history and physics and political science and literature and art who might like to be there and have something to do? Well, they can't get in. So this is another door to the room. We're in a, maybe 130 countries this year. The countries come and go, uh, so you know, maybe 130. But we've got 177 of these awards, and so even with my poor mathematics skills, that means many countries have more than one opportunity. And they organize themselves differently depending upon the country because it depends on the country and what they're asking for. But if you don't find an award dedicated to your discipline in a country, is there an all disciplines award? Typically there is, and that's probably the way you can get to that country. So remember, these are extremely important opportunities, and, and as of right now, 50% of our grants come through all discipline applications. There's no difference in pay, there's no difference in prestige, there's no difference in anything. There are two doors into the same room. One's through program awards and one's through all discipline awards, and they are there for a reason, and that is to make the program as broadly construed as possible. So you've already heard they're all over the place. Core grants are two to 12 months, etc. It depends. Hello. Uh, specialist grants are two to six weeks, and then our seminars usually run about two and a half weeks in length, so they're two to three weeks. In terms of activities, this is a very sliding scale because many awards will give you choices. Teaching, comma, research, comma, teaching slash research, which means a combination of the two. So then it's up to you. So these, this pie chart is only relatively valid because people choose different things out of all of these opportunities that are given to them. But about a quarter of our grants are pure research, about a third are pure teaching, about a third combined teaching and research, and then the rest, that little tiny green sliver, that's taken up by all those little special programs, the specialist grants and the, the uh, uh, various seminars that we want. There are some multi-country opportunities, keep them in mind, because we've got Sub-Saharan Africa Regional Research Program. These regional programs allow you to go up to as many as three countries in a region to conduct research. Sub-Saharan Africa breaks into two pieces. One of them is essentially an all-disciplines award, wide open, for pure research. The other is all about AIDS-related issues. And it's not so much about medicine, typically. Uh, it can be. But it's about uh, anthropology, sociology, political structures, economic impact of AIDS, etc. It's a very, very interesting program. There's a similar program without the AIDS component, Middle East and North Africa. There's another program in the uh, State Department's newest cone, which is South and Central Asia. So that's the Kyrgyz Republic, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, that whole piece of the world. You can go up to as many as three countries uh, to conduct your research through this particular award. In Europe, there's an EU Affairs Award, which is a very interesting one. And um, when I was administering, it grew up to, it grew up to 10 awards. And of course, I had nothing to do with that either. And it was the EU decided to put money into it. But it is a, an EU-focused concept. The, the research you conduct has to be about something that's going on in the EU. It's often comparative, uh, et cetera. But you can go up to three countries. As an historian, of course, I love the Austrian-Hungarian program. Because what we're really trying to do is find jobs for Habsburgs. But until that time has passed, <laughs> we would like for you to go and have the terrible burden of spending half your time in Vienna and half your time in Budapest. It's a rough life, and somebody's got to do that. <laughs> and in the Western Hemisphere right now, we have a single program. That's the Canada-Mexico Joint Award of North American Studies, which is a very interesting program to, it, it, on a, a, a Northern Hemisphere kind of you know, concept. What's going on in the three countries that occupy most of the Northern Hemisphere in the Western Hemisphere? So anyway, OK, now that you all worked up, we've got to go a couple minutes left. Okay, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to go to our website, which is www. The short address, by the way, is www.ciees.org. This is the long address, which is www.iie.org forward slash CIES. Once again, pitch at the same place. And why is that important? Because everything is online. We do not publish books of any kind anymore. We publish very few things, period, these days. You're looking at most of it over there on that table. 
Uh, and so uh, you're very welcome that you can read better because we got rid of 50,000 small telephone directories every year in terms of award catalogs. So the catalog is there. The catalog for the core program opens one February, closes, the competition closes one August for the following academic year. So we are currently in academic year 13, 14 for the core program. And we have to work that far in advance because they're all the fiscal issues, they're all the review issues, because everybody that's brother-in-law is going to look at your application and they will pass it along. You're probably reviewed about six times. So it's a very rigorous review process. Uh, there are also lots of tips on there. We clean the site up every year. We did it this year. We made it even simpler because we're trying to direct you to information that will be of, in of interest and value to you. Uh, we do webinars every Wednesday. Yes, uh, Hillary, by the way, is doing a webinar that I passed off to her while I was on the road because I suddenly realized I was supposed to be doing that one too. I started this three years ago. They've been very, very successful. So from the 1st of, August, from the 1st of February to the 1st of August, every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, we do a webinar about the core program. And it's uh, parts of the world, uh, disciplines, how to fill it out, uh, different kinds of people who are covered by the program. I've got one on disabilities coming up very soon. I did one on postdocs and uh, new uh, faculty just recently, pure research awards, we do them on Southeast Asia, we do them on STEM fields, etc., etc., etc. If you cannot participate in them, they run for an hour, they are, web the webinars go within into our archive, our webmaster who is an amazing individual usually has them up within a day or two days, and you can then listen to it, uh, the webinar and see all the slides for it through the archive. And I do know that people use it say to my horror, a man contacted me last year and said, I just listened to seven of your webinars. And once they revived me and I got back from the telephone, I said, Are you, have you been hospitalized? And he said, no, they were actually very, very helpful. And so I'm going to apply because you told me how to do everything. So anyway, keep these in mind. We throw out the previous year when we open the competition. We start afresh. So it's always, it's not going to be rehashed material. It's always for that year's competition. So the hard part about Fulbright is you have to pick an award. I think we're advertising 528 this year. You have to pick one, only one. You've got to put all your eggs into a single basket. Like it or not, that's what you have to do. So please keep in mind, all the awards are created in the hosting countries. We do not tell countries what they are going to ask for. They tell us what they are interested in. And that's why they don't look alike. And so Cambodia is not going to look like the Democratic Republic. Congo, which is not going to look like Canada, because they were all crafted in different countries by different people thinking about different needs and interests. So just keep that in mind. We do discuss these with countries when we get some rather bizarre awards, and we do get some rather strange ones, and I've had a number of dynamic conversations with hosting institutions and countries over the years, and some of them I think I won, some of them I lost. But in the long run, it's up to the hosting country to make these determinations, so that's why they look different. One way you can go, you can go on our website, uh, when you go to the award catalog, you land on a search page, and then there's a second, uh, more advanced search page that you can use. But you can drop, you, there are drop downs for all kinds of things by world area, and then you can click that and find out all the countries that are included in the world area. By country, and many people shop this way because they know, I want to go to France, I want to go to Cambodia, I want to go wherever. Long drop down, it is alphabetical, so that makes it tricky. Country names start, you know, A, B, C, D, and we do have people about that. Uh, so anyway, uh, you can find this very long list of country, and you click on that, you'll get a country overview about the whole program, you'll get the staff who work with it, you'll get the financial arrangements that are associated with that program, and then finally you'll get a list of every award that that country program is covering for this year. And then you click on those to get to the full descriptions of those awards. And what would you find? You'll find the country overview. You'll find the staff who work with it. You'll find the financial obligations and then the complete description of that award. So we always keep that information in front of you so you can't escape it. It's there all the time. All you have to do is read it. So country programs. You can also go by activity. There's a drop down. If you want to do teaching, bang, you can search for all of those. If you want to do peer research, bang, you can search for those. The combination of both, bang, you can research for that. And as I say, you're going to find that a number of awards give you choices. Uh, in all of Sub-Saharan Africa, if you're not going through the regional research program, except South Africa, which has all options, you're going to find that the awards on a country basis are going to be 
teaching or teaching and research. Those are the two choices you've got. So they'll show up, you've got to make a choice between the two. In many countries, you'll find every single award has a choice between all three activities. And especially, uh, all discipline awards often offer all of those options as well. So it really is entirely up to you to think through what is it you want to do, how do you want to do it in this particular country. Please read the descriptions, they're there for a reason. As I said, they were designed in the hosting country. So at least give them that much respect to read what they designed for you. And if you don't have any, uh, if you have a hard time understanding it, contact us. Or you'll often find there's information on how to contact people in the hosting country. Contact them as well to get clear exactly what it is they're looking for. Because some things seem evident to the person, as you probably know. The person who writes understands it perfectly. The person who reads may not quite get it. So if you've got a question, ask about it. It's foolish not to. The, the uh, components of an, of, a, of an application, there's a form, fill in the blank. It's done by Embark, we don't like it, we got stuck with it, we think the contract is over this year, we're trying desperately to get rid of them. And the reason is, not that it doesn't work, but it does things that don't make any sense, and we've had to put not applicable in a lot of places, because Embark will not personalize the application for us. So we've done what we can, but it works just fine. And it is to that application that you attach all of the other pieces. A project statement. Very important, five pages. It's where you make your case to everybody who is going to read your application inside and outside the, uh, the United States about who you are basically in a short version, what it is you want to do, how you plan to accomplish it, and what the point of it all is. What are the outcomes? And that's five pages. Now, if you apply to do combined teaching and research, we have a special deal for you. You have five pages to make your case for doing both. So it's quite unforgiving. You've got five pages. It's very hard for many academics, and I understand why, to make a really good case in five pages. But you really want to think about this and organize your thoughts, because that's it. That's your conversation with everybody who reads it. So it's a very important piece. You want an up-to-date, well-organized CV or resume. Why? Because that's your autobiographical information, the vast majority of who you are, what you've done, what you've invented, what you've written, the cases before the Supreme Court, when you danced at the, you know, the Royal Ballet, whatever, that's all in your CV. So it's a very important piece and people look at it very, very carefully. You want to, for teaching awards, you're going to want to do some outlines of syllabi because your people are going to want to know, well, what are you going to teach? You know, and admittedly, this is a proposition that may be being made on, entirely on speculation. Sometimes it will tell you, we want American literature, a colonial period and Mark Twain. That makes it easy. In a lot of cases, it's this is what I'm interested in teaching and why I think it would be of interest to you. And here are the syllabi. They are not typically day to day syllabi. So we don't care about which pages you're going to read on Tuesday and what you're going to discuss about Mary buying a red wagon and how Spot the Dog responded to it. Rather, it's the idea of what are you going to be teaching about? What's your flow of information? Where do you start? Where do you end up? What's your methodology? Is it all going to be computer work? Is it all going to be reading in English? Is it going to be class assignments? Is it going to be working with the community? People do all kinds of things. And as was pointed out by our expert panel, Americans are constantly shaking up pedagogy across the world by doing things that other people don't do. And having gone to attended universities in both Germany and Russia, I can tell you it was the professor who walked in, opened a book, read a book to you, shut the book, and walked out. And Americans walk in, they go, okay, you know what, your, uh, your chair's in a circle. Let's talk about, and people are looking at it like, I beg your pardon. And then all of a sudden they realize, gosh, these people actually care what I'm thinking about. They're trying to elicit uh, information from me. They're trying to elicit opinions. They're trying to get us all to work together to do something. I've never seen this before. Gee, I kind of like being involved in the teaching sometimes. It's kind of interesting. And so Americans are breaking pedagogical molds all the time. Sometimes they get a little carried away, but we won't go into that. Uh, but anyway, by and large, Americans have done an awful lot for the passing out of American pedagogical techniques, and it's very important that people like it. So you need Sylvan. For research base, you need a select bibliography. It basically says you know what's going on in the field. That's essentially what it proves. You'll need three letters of reference. Because I'm doing this very fast, I'm skipping lots of slides. So let's talk about the letters of reference real quickly. OK, you need three letters. For a research proposal, it's just three straight letters of, of reference. It's always helpful, potentially, to have a letter from one person outside your whole institution. And the reason for that is it just shows you have a bigger footprint, that 
you're involved in professional organizations, that you do papers, and you've done a collegial teaching proposal with somebody in another university, whatever, it's not required, it's just not a bad idea to have that if that's appropriate for what you've done. The other thing is if you're doing a teaching proposal, one of those three letters must talk about you as a teacher, and that's very important. It's the kind of, uh, typically it comes from someone who has been a, a supervisor somehow, but someone who can evaluate you on a somewhat less emotional or personal basis, but as a classroom presence. This person is a superb teacher. Students respond very well to him or her, uh, handles questions very well. Sometimes those are very interesting letters to read because there'll be something like da 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 seems to be challenged by questions. And peers will always go, seems to be challenged by questions. Anyway, there, it's important to get that letter for a teaching, uh, for a teaching grant. So remember, you want a teaching letter. Um, it, there may be supplemental materials that you want to add or that are required. It's going to depend upon the program. It will tell you. Do you need a language proficiency report to prove that you are not fluent in Khmer or whatever, or that you can that you're fluent in Latin? But if you've got all of your publications or medieval church records and you've been a translator and commentator, most people are going to figure, yeah, I can do that. It's pretty obvious I do it all the time. Grew up in a Spanish-speaking home. I'm fluent in Spanish. Was born in Argentina, etc. People are going to assume that, yeah, you've probably maintained your language skills, especially if you went all the way through undergraduate school there. And so we're not going to be questioning your ability. To uh, actually, they did. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but they may or may not. But anyway, in a case where if you if you ever think that there's a question, get it. And it should be, and it's quite easy to do. It's just a form letter, essentially. It's not a big deal. Um, if you need a letter of invitation, the award will tell you you need a letter of invitation. Letter of invitation required. Letter of invitation recommended. Those are the ones I really love. Because it's like, would you please make up your mind? Just say yes or no. Don't say recommended. That means it's a good idea to get one. But if you don't have one, it doesn't mean you're shot out of the water. If it says it's required, it means it's required. You're going to have to get a letter from a host institution saying that, yes, we are willing to have you here as a Fulbright. And then there are countries that don't require any. Russia doesn't require one. You get a letter of invitation, that's fine. But our office in Moscow will place you, even if you don't have a letter of invitation. So it's going to vary by country. Talk to the program staff if you have a question. And in some fields, people add materials uh, because as demonstrations of what their work looks like. This is typical in the arts in practicing journalists, in poets, etc. It is not typical for physicists or historians or sociologists, etc. We take your word for it, and there's usually a section about your published work or whatever, because that's not what you're applying to be. You're not applying to be a teacher of language as a historian. Usually you're applying as a historian. But a ballet dancer is applying to be teaching ballet, and we want to know, well, can't you, teach, can't you dance or not? I don't know. Uh, so anyway, you may want to add samples of architecture, paintings, I say slides, not buildings or, you know, oils, we'd love to have them, but don't worry, just send slides. Okay, very quickly, how do you get a letter of invitation if you don't have one? I'm trying to hit the high points here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, because a lot of people get very upset. Americans don't like asking for favors of people they don't know. Guess what? You don't have a choice. If you got to have a letter of invitation, you don't know anybody in the country, you're going to have to figure out a way to do it. How do you do that? Well, my first recommendation, start local. You are very fortunate to be in an institution like this because it is crawling with all kinds of people who've either been someplace or from there or just got back or whatever. Talk to them. Go to your international office. Find out who's around if you don't know. Ask questions because there are going to be lots of people on campus. Now, they may not be the people who can invite you, but they can tell you what's going on in the country, what institutions are good for this or that. They can give you leads on how to begin a search to find somebody who's going to be interesting and helpful and able to give you a letter of invitation. Look on our website. We have lists, Fulbright Scholar list divided by American scholars and visiting scholars divided by year. And then you can find them, you can check out by country, you can find them by topic, you can find them by all kinds of things, by home institution, etc. Contact Fulbrighters. Because I tell every Fulbrighter that I've painted a target on your back the second you got a grant. And I'm going to be sending people after you for the rest of your lousy life. So just get over it. Because they're going to need letters of invitation or they're going to be looking for information. They don't even have to be in your field, but they've been in that country. Talk to them. 
find out what the landscape looks like. They're available for that. That's why we give you those lists. Um, another thing is look at your professional associations. They have international memberships. Almost all of them have paid the Jews for years and made them pay you back now. Give you a list of the people in this country or those countries in your field. Contact them. They're in the same field. Who's publishing in your field? Lots of international publications. Send them, send them a fan letter. I just never read or find this letter on daffodil, the balls, on the simply the. I would now like some information. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, and so, and there's also things like Brain Track, which is a website that you can use to find out about international education. And finally, if you can't do a web search at this stage in life, and it's almost 2000, and it's almost 2000, isn't it? I think. <laughs> anyway, uh, if you can't do a web, a web search, you're in a lot of trouble. So sit down and do a web search. That's probably, that may actually be the most productive way to find information about the places that you're looking for and the people in those fields. Uh, the review process very quickly. Okay, goes through thousands of reviews. We do a technical review, but an electronic application, it's hard to submit them without filling things in appropriately. However, letters of recommendation, typically an invitation, are added often after you fill in an application because that's the nature of the beast. You can monitor your application after you submit it to make sure that all the parts are there. We cannot see it. So we can't monitor it until the whole process is finished. You can, and it's your responsibility. So look in every so often to make sure those letters have been attached. If they haven't been, write the person. Find out, are you gonna write the letter? Did you ever get the message? An electronic message is sent out, and they add their letters to your application. So check those uh, while, you, while you're in charge of the situation. The deadline for the letters is the same as the deadline for the yes. yes. And, it, can, can I, and it's also a good idea once you put someone into the system who's going to be writing a letter of recommendation that you get in touch with them yes. and say, did you receive the email? Well, first of all, you get in touch with them before asking them if they'll do it. And then if they say yes, get in touch with them to make sure that they've received the email from the system and it hasn't got into a spam filter someplace. Sometimes they do, but maybe get the, that's not as common as it once was, but sometimes they will wind up in a spam filter. So asking people if they've got, remember, this is for you. This is about you. Hurting all those kittens on your part is a good idea because you've got the chance to do it and you're completely empowered. So if you don't do it, then the onus is entirely on you for having failed to see through your application because we can't do it for you. We literally cannot do it. So then after we do the quick technical review after the deadline, uh, all specializations are given peer review by three people who uh, do it electronically. So we have three peers for every, every single field that we offer. And of course, many of those fields wind up having to have more than one set of these peer reviewers, otherwise they'd be reading you know, 400 applications that we have a lot of trouble with, because these are all volunteers, basically. But they're all academics and they're all peers. And so we have, I think, 86 academic peer review committees right now that read, they're asked to comment on the proposal, and they're asked to recommend you forward or not. They cannot take you out of the process, but they're asked to justify why this is a good proposal in nuclear physics or why it's not a good proposal, and then whether they recommend you forward or not. The next set of reviewers also peers meet in Washington in individual geographically focused committees. There are typically five people on those committees. We do our best to ensure every kind of representation you can think of, you know, gender, size of home institution, da 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 but they're all people who have worked in the countries that they're looking at, and wherever possible are full, former Fulbrights, because Fulbright has this outcomes issue that we're interested in. What are you gonna do, and what's the point of all your research, or teaching, whatever. And so then they, they look at every, uh, every application for every country in that group of country, and then they create panels. And that's when we send out the first set of letters that are, we've always referred to internally as these so sorry, so happy letters. And of course, by coming to this, you get a so happy letter. It's just virtually guaranteed. Uh, but anyway, and that is that you're being recommended forward from the process. At that point, the process goes in two directions. Those letters come out typically October and November, sometimes late September. It depends on when the committees meet, because once again, we've got 80 something of those area committees. And so they can't all be done the same day for obvious reasons. And so they're staggered over a period of several months. They go in two directions at one time. One, it goes to the uh, Department of State, where our colleagues look them over, but that's not a tech, that's not a review. They can't take you out of it. And the J. William Fulbright Park Scholarship Board, the part that we pointed out several more programs, also look at it for eligibility 
purposes. Remember, citizenship, appropriate degree, oops, I forgot to mention, have you been convicted of a felony? You have to attest to that. You have to do that because of one of my people who went to Estonia a long time ago, and his parole officer called me. And until that date, no one had ever thought that an academic was not, could be a naughty person. But it turns out some of you are a very naughty person. Uh, and you can appeal the, the felony. You can say why. Because there are a lot of people who got stuck with felonies during the Vietnam War, for instance, for protesting the war, and their fellow citizens decided, well, we're just going to fix you. We'll give you a felony on your record. Those have been appealed, as far as I know. Every one of them has been successful, and people have gone on from there. But there are some people who have done some much worse things, and those don't get appealed. Uh, but anyway, so the felony conviction. So the J. William Fulbright Farm Scholarship Board, because they are the oversight board, approves that. The other side is going overseas, where it's going to be reviewed fully in country. Typically, members of the American Embassy or the, and or the Fulbright Commission, if there is one, there are 50 of them in the world, or the two Fulbright offices, Ukraine and Moscow. Or, I mean, and uh, the local, uh, typically the local Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Higher Education, and local and American academics will also be discussed it, pass on it, and then it will probably be reviewed by the hosting institution as well. And so after all of those reviews, those thousands of people have read everything you had to say and looked at you, that's when the final grants are being given out. So that's why the grants don't come out until the earliest period is typically late January, usually then until as much as April, because those things are moving all back and forth all the time. And I work with France and everybody's on vacation in France all the time. I don't know how a country can work with that way, but anyway, en vacances is typical of everything that goes on in France. And so you never hear from them until the very end of March. And that's just because of the nature of France. So anyway, that's the basic process. OK, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Andy. We corresponded on Anna Corey Holcomb. And uh -huh. I made it through the US last year. And the Italians, my own people, said no. Yes. And so I'm, I'm looking at hedging my bets for doing this again. And so I had some questions. Uh, is it better to go for something close and comfortable, which the Italian one would be for me? and knowing the people that had advised me and that kind of thing? Or should I be considering something that might be more di different and a uh, different type of country, uh, perhaps more challenging? Uh, my proposal had lots of different connections I could make in the same, not just the same institution, but the ones in the area. Would it be better to focus on one particular thing that I would be doing? And then uh, are there things like better to apply for a semester than a year? You know, is, it, is there an advantage to some of those kinds of things? Or, I know Italy obviously is, is, is bound to be very competitive because it's, it is. everybody wants to go to Italy. Um, so, you know, should I be thinking about you know some other, other country that might not be so popular? So, have to you know in order to have a, a, a Fulbright experience, so just sort of hedging my bets, which which sorts of things might I be looking at? Thank you for that simple question. <laughs>
So four to five months, four to five months. So or a, you know nine months or a year. I mean that's kind of ten months, you know whatever an academic year. That's kind of a given. Now a lot of Americans hedge that by saying, well you know I, I'm doing one semester, I have to be back by Christmas for various reasons, and so they're able to squeeze it down. Because typically when you're teaching, you're not taking anybody's place in the classroom. You're offering an elective or a series of electives. So you're taking something that people don't. You're not taking you know, Frida's job and saying, okay, Frida, take a vacation. I'm, I'm moving in now. Rather, you're adding to what Frida's been offering and what the university's been offering to its students. So there's some manageability there. With research, you have to be able to make a case for why do you need that period of time in order to be successful. I'm going to talk to the daughter of Gilles Prepperfeld, the famous author, and I need 10 months to do it. Most people are going to look at that and go, oh, really? What in the name of heaven it's going to take you 10 months to talk to one person. I'm going to interview 150 selected people in 14 cities around the country, and I need two months. I don't think so, because you can't even get on the train that fast. So it's got to be, there's got to be a relationship and a research grant between what you're asking for and what the country's willing to offer. France, in most of its awards, not the regional awards, but most of its other awards, the longest you can get is six months. And what will happen is that sometimes it's because of the way they read the proposal, it may also be because they want to squeeze more grants out of the money they've got, they give you five. Say, okay, so hurry up. Uh, you know, we think you could do this in five. And we're not necessarily going to tell you that we really believe you can do it in five, or that we're trying to save money in order to give another grant to somebody by shaving a month off of everybody. But that could be what they're doing. But the issue is you want to make a good and solid case for what it is you wish to accomplish, what you, how much time you need in which to do it. And if it looks like you're padding or it looks like you've underestimated, the reviewers are going to look at that, especially when it gets in country, but it could very well happen here and say, I don't get it. Why? How can you possibly do this? Or why do you need this much time? It doesn't make any sense. You haven't made a good case for it. So as I say, I think it's very much an individual situation. It depends uh, on what it is you're proposing to do, how you plan to do it, etc as to the time that you're requesting, if that's a negotiable issue. Uh, you know, the Netherlands gives you four months. They go, that's it. And they want teaching or teaching and research. And they'll help you get a visa if you want to stay longer. That's just fine. But four months for Fulbright in, in total. So you have to propose the thing that you're going to do in the Netherlands in a four-month period. And in France, it goes from three to six months, with the exception of the regional program, da 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 so once again, it's going to depend on what you want to do and where you want to do it now. So I don't think there is a hard and fast rule to be quite honest. So two questions, one easy one, not as much. So uh, once you get the happy day, what's your what's your monthly your kid average after that? So how once again, that's going to depend upon the country. Yeah. But if it's France, they want at least a three to one ratio of recommended grants, of recommended application forward to the grants yeah. that will be given. So you know that that review in Paris is going to be very important and that two out of every three people are not going to get a grant. I would ask the program officer, you know, what are the odds in this particular thing when you send it forward? In some countries, it's one-on-one. -on -one. You know, some countries and some awards are not very popular. And so it may very well be that being recommended for it, unless the country just says absolutely no, uh, you know, will probably turn into a grant. But don't ever count on it, you know, because there are all kinds of things that can happen. But your chances are better. And then the other one is, is, is a, I'm going to call it a spouse program, but not quite in the sense of, you know, two, two academics, right, going to the same country, and if only he got it, his wife would not have gone, so he would not have gone. So how do you Maybe. Know? I don't know where, I don't know how you would have handled it, but I've also seen grants where husband and wife both applied and were both successful. Right. But I've seen grants where both applied and only one was successful. And only one time, it was when the wife was successful, interestingly enough, husband wasn't, she came back and she said, well, it means more to my husband's career for him to get the grant, so you can take my grant and give it to him. It's like, no. That's right. The way it worked out was you were the one who were recommended, and so she finally decided that she wouldn't take the grant. It's like, that's okay. I mean, that's your decision. Uh, you base it on whatever information or needs you have. Uh, but there is no program per se for husbands and wives. No, but then you said, wait for the application that, you know, you're only going to give it to me, give it to somebody else. No. I wouldn't do it. I mean, if you really want the grant, my answer is no. 
Because anytime you, and people, I've seen teams go from a particular institution before and be successful in applying. And they mentioned that, you know, uh, my associate Joe and my associate Louise are both also applying for the Fulbright program in Poland. Actually, it was in Russia. But anyway, you know, protecting the uh, And the thing was, but, but they all had to understand, I told them very clearly, if you make it so that if Joe and Louise don't go, the whole thing falls apart, then the chances are very good that the whole thing's going to fall apart. Because there's no way to, to guarantee that everybody's going to get recommended. Yeah, so so they, need to, they need to have some individual quality. Mm -hmm. Everybody yeah. has to. You can't yeah. totally rely on one on the other. No, no, that's okay. But even yeah. if they're individually okay, there are many, many cases, you know, totally different areas of research, but one spouse doesn't have right. it, and one's not going to go. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's it. They're, nobody's going to be mad at you because they might scratch their head and say, gee, that's too bad. But if that's the way it works, then that's the way, that's the way it works. And that's the decision, ultimately, that you make. I have a question about the project statement. Obviously, the, as, the, as the application goes through, the process becomes more and more specialized with the people more and more knowledgeable on the ground, so to speak. But that first group is sort of a broader group. So in terms of introductory paragraph on the application form, I mean, to speak to Cambodia's history, I mean, people in Cambodia know the Cambodian history, but yet, you know, if your body of work is relational to the effects of modern history, what do you do? You explain in five pages. <laughs> you make the best case you can. People understand that. I mean, the reviewers understand you've got five pages to make a case. Certainly make reference to the fact. And you can do, there's a lot that one can do in a sentence or two mm -hmm. to give a sense that, yes, I know what the issues are. But you're not are. insulting. By stating the obvious. Well, it, it's maybe obvious to you, but it may not be obvious to everyone who's going to read it. And the thing that you want to make clear is that it is obvious to you that you do understand the context, why it's important, you know, how it came about, whatever the issues are. Uh, and so, and you have to, as I say, you, you got five pages, and it's it's a real problem for academics because I know that you can tell I'm a man of few words. I can write until the cows come home. I can just rip those pages out of a computer faster than you can see straight. The problem is getting it all boiled down like that. Always have somebody else read it, by the way. Don't be embarrassed to do that. Because if they're having, if your fellows are having, a, you know, a, a what kind of a moment, or I, uh -huh, I don't understand, you know, that's very telling. Because if they're having it, everybody else is probably going to have it too, and you're going to need to figure out how to tweak a sentence or two so that, that transition is there, or so that purpose is there, so that linkage is there between what you've done before and what you want to do now, et cetera. Because let's face it, we're all our own worst critics. Because everything I write is absolutely fabulous. And so uh, I know that that's true. But other people might not be quite as bright as I am and therefore not quite get, get my, my fabulous qualities immediately. So let one of them read it and figure out and let it you know, tell you what, the, what you need for the, the hoi polloi to make sense out. Other questions? Hey, you stay over time. I'm going to give you all A pluses for attendance today. Thank you very much. Thank you.